Thank you very much, Trevor, and, and thank you very much for the invitation to the ACPA committee to, to bring me over here. It's always a pleasure to come to Australia. Um, when I set out to plan a talk, I was thinking along the lines of, well, I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening in Europe as far as CTF is concerned. Unfortunately, when I got down to actually looking at it, it made me realise that actually I know very little. I know very little actually about what's happening in the UK as far as control traffic is concerned, other than it is being taken up on an increasingly rapid rate. But how many hectares are in CDF in the UK at the moment? I really don't know. And I can only think that a, or a survey is needed to actually establish what, what that is. And the same across Europe. There are fragmented outcrops, as it were, of CTF happening in different places. What I'm going to do today, as you'll see from the title, is trying to encourage you not to forget the roots of CTF and to keep to the straight and narrow. If I've got time at the end of that, I will just quickly run through one or two slides showing how we achieve CTF in Europe, which is just slightly different for a matter of constraints of how we achieve it. So hopefully we'll have time for that. Firstly, though, to really reiterate why it is that we're in controlled traffic. And there are numerous benefits from not driving on paddocks or fields, as we call them. Um, it can find subsoil damage to a very confined area. Not only subsoil damage, but topsoil damage. And uh, that has a, a lot of um, positive outcomes. Because as you'll see from the slide here, that if we look back over the past sort of 80 odd years, back to the 1930s, the pressure that we're exerting on subsoils, and this comes from, from modeling, uh, two different models which come up roughly with the same thing, is that if we look at the time when here, when horses were the main driver for, or the main primary source of power, we've got a pressure at half a meter depth of 0.1 of a bar. But as you can see, that has risen inexorably until here, when we just see a slight dip. And that was the introduction of uh, radial ply tires. But then you can see that it's risen even more rapidly since, so that here we are up, up here. Um, out of the 850, yeah, the 850 kilogram horse is now being replaced by a vehicle, you know, weighing 24, 30 tons. So that's an unseen effect. It's so deep that we can't see it. It's quite difficult to measure it, uh, and it's certainly very expensive to remediate it. So probably more expensive than we can actually afford. So it's a big, big negative effect. Um, it's not just uh, on, on crop soils that we see the benefits of control traffic in reducing tillage inputs. That's a really big factor involved. And if you're not making use of those reductions in tillage inputs after going to control traffic, then you're missing a lot of the benefits. We also see benefits in grassland, and there's a recent study just been published. But I took this photo on a farm in, in Northern England some years ago, happened to be staying on this farm when they were carrying out a silage operation here. And I was there a week later and you can see all those tracks showing up. And that actually, that slide was the reason why one, one farmer in the UK at least took up controlled traffic, he just realized how much tracking there was going on in his fields. Um, and obviously that's improving yield and quality of fodder uh, and reducing fuel consumption where we've got village operations. This little video, quality is a bit poor because it's taken quite a long year to go, go. Um, we set up a trial, the first trial in the UK on CTF, and this was on a clay soil in December, so feel that the soil moisture very high. This was in a no-till paddock, three years, random traffic. So not a lot of traffic in there, but you can see, hell of a job to dig out. Within a couple hundred meters of that, same field in, in the rotation, um, been in control traffic and no till for three years. Just a whole different ball game. And I could take farmers around these two fields and within 10 minutes I could convince them, yeah, control traffic is just a sensible thing to do. So that was a, a, a start of it. 
an increase in crop yields. This is actually something really difficult to determine on your own farm, because once you con convert it to control traffic, you convert your whole farm. You don't leave a few paddocks and say, well, I'll, I'll compare. So these data are taken from research worldwide, looking at fully replicated trials to see, well, what are the effects in terms of yield um, benefit? And you can see actually that wheat here in the, in the middle is probably one of the lowest um, responders. It's probably been bred to deal with compaction. If you think about how breeding programs go, it's obviously been bred for compaction, but there are a lot of crops here that respond far more uh, dramatically to, um, to control traffic systems. So those are some of the major benefits. We're also improves infiltration and drainage. We've heard about that this morning and to, earlier today. Um, I think tomorrow we'll hear, we'll hear from Dio about cutting on N losses through denitrification and nitrous oxide emissions. Um, those could be pretty dramatic effects as well as waste fertilizer that we've paid to be working on our crop. Somebody also talked about um, how ground pressure, you know, the pressure in the tire is related to topsoil compaction, axle load related to deeper in the profile. I think Scott talked about this. I find a useful little rule of thumb is this one here, that the pressure at the surface, shown here, um, reduces to half its value at a depth equivalent to the width of the tire. I'm told that that's a pretty accurate estimation of what happens. And if you work through that for any given tire or load, you'll just see how it works. Um, so that's a, a useful thing to bear in mind. But also to bear in mind that pressure never increases with depth, it also, re also reduces. So if you've got a low pressure at the surface, it's, it's obviously better in terms of pressure stress through the profile. Um, but those are, it's the axle load that causes the problem. In the 1980s, I was running a trial on a clay soil, a, a highly expanding and contracting clay soil, and we had three systems. Uh, conventional uh, traffic, which was just conventional vehicles at conventional pressures, and okay, we'd, you know, in the 1980s, we're talking much, more, much lower loads, um, maximum wheel load of 3.1 tonne, and a pressure here with a low ground pressure system of less than 50 kilopascals. And these slides show that low ground pressure system where we've dueled up the wheels, we've lowered the inflation pressure right through, the, the drill had lowered, the combine harvester had dual wheels, so it was a whole system. Compared that with, with zero traffic or a non-traffic system. And you can see here, this was the effect of the combine harvester on the same day used on adjacent plots uh, with standard wheel equipment or with the jewels front and, and rear when lowered inflation pressures. You can see here is the result of conventional and here the low ground pressure. So pretty dramatic effect. Um, you could almost, you could hardly tell where that combine had been. So you can see how, how much improvement we achieved. However, um, that low ground pressure system was obviously putting down more wheel area than we would with a conventional system. So what we found was happening, we were getting a little bit more topsoil compaction. It was over a, a wider area. So on average, we were getting a higher um, comp compaction across the plots. And you'll see that in terms of the energy required for tillage. Probably if we're looking at tillage or, or drilling or the total of the two, then conventional 178 compared with low ground pressure of 182. So not a big effect, but this was after, I think, three years. Um, we were seeing that gradual build-up of pressure in the surface when we were only cultivating to about 10 centimetres deep maximum. So it was in that area where we were seeing that, uh, that build-up. But then again, of course, you can see that the control traffic had a, a very dramatic reduction in, in energy, energy requirement. Some years later... Um, I was in a position to carry out some trials on a field that had been in control traffic for five years, and we imposed a number of different loads on that soil um, from different vehicles. It was actually in pretty dry conditions, um, but we had wheel or track loads of between four and seven tons. And you can see 
here's the conditions we're working in, you can see no imprint from that tractor or indeed from this uh, tracked vehicle or, or in fact the combine. You could hardly see where those vehicles had been. So these were loads imposed on soil that had been in control traffic for five years. To my great surprise, this was the result. So here is the trace of penetration resistance on the non-trafficked five-year soil. So that's the initial condition. And I thought in the dry conditions that nothing would happen. But as you can see, every vehicle we put across there led to a dramatic increase in penetration resistance. Uh, and these are just the, the, the different uh, treatments we put in. So that would be a tract cultivation or track tractor, uh, two passes of track tractor, a wheeled combine and a wheeled tractor, um, and so forth. However, six months later, this is the result. Now, don't be fooled by these two lines. These two lines are plots that we subsoil after those initial tracking. So the subsoiling is showing up quite dramatically, but here now is the CTF line coming down pretty much in the middle of the others. So what I think we're seeing is that that soil was, after five years in CTF, was actually much more resilient. It, be, it became, in a way, elastic rather than plastic. It was able to actually regain its structure after a few months. Now that was fine because it was in reasonably dry conditions. I think if you see another instance of where tracking has been put in in moist conditions, then it's a whole different story. This is where um, a chaser has gone off, off piste, as it were. Um, it, the unloading auger wouldn't allow the, the, the chaser to stay on those adjacent wheel tracks. And you can see immediately the soil condition has changed from non-traffic to traffic. I don't know if you can pick out in this light, but a farmer um, went across at an angle um, to, to try and spread the straw. We have a lot of straw to deal with, and, and he regretted doing so because that tracking actually showed up in his crop for quite some time to come. So really important that even with a fairly light tractor, going off piste in moist conditions is just not, not something you want to do. It uh, compromises your system. Um, and once damaged, soil can take a long time to recover. Depends on what sort of soil is involved, but um, you'll only recover, some soils will recover through uh, soil organisms, through rooting systems that gradually penetrate and create porosity and organic matter in the soil. So that soil will take some time to recover, whereas one with expanding and contracting clay will be somewhat quicker. It still won't be quick. I think after five years in CTF, we could see on a soil like this restructuring down to about just less than 20 centimeters. So again, it, you know, once you damage it, it's, it's not going to be undone very quickly. The traffic effects also run pretty deep in the profile. We had an opportunity to compare the draft force on a mole plow uh, working 55 centimeters deep in, a non, in an area that's been non-traffic for four years compared with the one that we trafficked. And you can see there that we had a 17% increase in draft, even at that depth, from that mole plow running on the uh, non-traffic compared with the, or the traffic compared with the non-traffic soil. So one of my messages, I think yeah, the primary one, and we all are involved in this, is respecting and knowing your soils. Um, even small loads and low pressures can have deleterious effects. Um, Prolonged use of CTF can build up resilience and allow the odd misdemeanor, uh, but only in dry conditions. Don't think you can get away with it um, in other conditions. So, or indeed, you don't really want to get away with it at all. Leave well alone. Soils do take a long time to recover naturally, um, particularly below the, below the, the lower topsoil. Um, and just because you can't see damage doesn't mean to say it's there. I find soil profiles quite difficult to interpret. Um, I think you need to be pretty much of an expert to be able to do that. Um, but very often the damage is there even if you can't see it. For those who have not gone into a CTF system yet, um, we'd encourage them, well, at least put your combine, your header, into a CTF system 
and make it a multiple of three times your, or a third of your, your boom sprayer width. Um, that works well, and we've heard about that earlier on. Um, keep, keep faith and watch your soils improve over time and your profits as a result of that. I think it's, it's worth to, I think we're all convinced that it's worth staying there, but don't, don't go off piste if, if you can possibly avoid it. I'd also like to make a plug for what I think is the next generation, and it frustrates me that uh, people aren't going down this route or manufacturers aren't showing more interest in this, and that is, and we saw it with the automated system a bit earlier this afternoon, is widespread or gantry tractor systems, where this vehicle offers so much more other than control traffic. It's a very stable platform. It probably you could get a system like this where it would track about 5% of the area, in which case you can think about engineering those traffic lanes without actually reducing yield. You'd still get an in, in, increase in yield even though you've taken 5% of the land out of production. And uh, these machines have been around actually since the 1850s uh, when they were powered by steam. There were one or two that were actually in, in use then. Um, and we've got a, a, a little video that um, you can look at to see exactly how this vehicle would work in a paddock. Um, it's, it's a bit of a, until you've seen or actually use one, it's very difficult to understand how they work. But uh, I think they're the next generation of mechanization just waiting in the wings for us to grasp and actually make maximum use of in association with autonomous vehicles or as an autonomous vehicle. I'm a bit worried about the DOT technology which screams out to me, why didn't they make it a gantry instead of sticking the implements out the side, putting two very high pressure wheels straight on your, your crop bed? You know, they're horrendous, horrendous wheels on that vehicle. Why on earth do you do that? So I think if I've run out of time, I will call a halt there. Thanks very much. Yeah.